So we're going to talk a little bit about how to build the bridge so you have an expectation of what you're going to see. But first, a little bit about what is the bridge. So it's about 1,720 feet long. It'll have buses, light rail, pedestrians and bicyclists, and in the future, a streetcar. Be no autos on this bridge. It has two 14-foot wide paths on either side for pedestrians and bicyclists. And in the middle, there's about two 14-foot travel lanes for the buses and the, and the uh, light rail. For most of the bridge, it's about 75 feet wide. And then at the towers, it gets a little wider as the walkway goes around the towers. So why did we pick a cable stayed structure? This was a three year long process. It responded a lot to the engineering challenges. Remember we have on one side of Ross Island, there's the Holgate navigation route that Ross Island comes out of. And then there's the main route, which goes underneath the center spans of the bridges. So how to accommodate both of those routes, how to avoid shallow water habitat, how to avoid subsurface utilities as a 36 inch water main, how to keep the piers in deep water for the, the fish. So how to do all that, yet how to make it stations at grade to support the development on either side, but how to make the bridge very thin to make it as high as possible for the river users. So this was the bridge that met all of those challenges. It's wide to accommodate the various navigational routes. It's very thin in order to accommodate making the bridge as high as possible. It also is a very, very efficient structure which makes it very economical. So it really fired on all those cylinders. And it looks pretty good too. <laughs> so this is just some of the terminology. So as you look at the various things, you'll know what we're talking about. Of course, engineers use all sorts of different terms for different things. So they call the things on land side abutments. Then they call things piers sometimes. They might call them pylons. They might call them towers. So this is just a graphic explaining what all the parts and pieces are. But really, the work starts in the middle of the river. That's where the work that's going to be beginning today. So you'll see that. So in order to do that work, we needed to talk about navigational clearance a little bit. So how did we pick the bridge height? So we took a look at all of the data that's out there from back in the 1879 to today. We have records for every single day of what the river elevation was. So how do we figure out what's the right height? Now realizing there are quite a few dams that have been built along the area. So along this journey, they built a variety of dams. And we took a look at after the dams are built, the water stopped going up and down so much. So we analyzed that data. And what we found was that ordinary high water is about 14.7. We found that the fluctuations are pretty modest. They go from about 16 to 20, but they used to go a lot more before the dams. And so we did all this analysis to figure the right bridge height. And we came up to 7752 allows most users about 99% passage. The rules are what's reasonable in order to accommodate navigation. It also has to balance with the land side. So this was kind of the sweet spot in all our analysis. So if we're going to start the construction, we're going to have big equipment out on the river. Now you might imagine you've got a, a derrick barge, which is like a crane on a barge. And it has a boom that's way out there, and it's got a big piece of steel on it. You don't want a boat going by and rocking that derrick barge, because then that makes it not the most safe environment. So the Oregon State Marine Board granted us a, a slow zone. And so that's in effect now, and that'll last until December of 2012. That just allows it to be a safe work environment. And it goes about 500 feet on either side of the work zone. So this is a little hard to see right here, but you'll see it better in your handouts. Essentially, in order to build that out in the river, you need to get a way to get there. So there are two work bridges, one on either side. That allows the workers a way to get access out to the middle of the river. How do I build in the water? Well, you create a little sand island. So you create a coffer dam. That allows you a place out in the middle of the river, a little sand island to work. So you can see that here, there's a work bridge, and then a work bridge, and there's a, be a coffer dam on either side. So here's a, an image of, of what, from past projects. Essentially, there's a steel frame, and then there's sheet piles that are driven around the side. 
and that creates a dry area to work. And inside that, you build the foundations. And then you need to get access to it, and that's the work bridge. So you can see here, here's an example of the work bridge. That allows workers to get access to it. So here's the illustration how those two relate. How does the cofferdam relate to the work out in the river? So you can see here's the cofferdam. That creates your sand island, dry place to work out in the middle of the river. And you can see here's the foundations, the drilled shafts. You can see the pile cap and the tower. You see this creates a place to work. You also see some scour protection, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Assuming we can get the slide to advance. So what's the first thing you do? Well, the first thing you do is you put down about a foot to a foot and a half of sand. That's to kind of keep the river bottom where it's at and not stir it up and create what they call turbidity. So that's the first thing you do is you put down a layer of sand. And you can see that, you know, there's your derrick and there's your material barge and they're going to put the sand in. It's done very carefully not to stir up uh, the river bottom. Then you put in that cofferdam frame. Remember, that's about 110 by 71 feet wide. It's about 20 feet tall, so it's a big item. If you look real closely, you'll see kind of little templates for where the drilled shafts will go. So they put that in the river, and then they'll vibratory in sheet piles. And they're interlocking to prevent that water tight. So you can see the sheet piles here. And they'll go around the whole thing create that watertight area. Then they'll bring in a specialist to remove any fish that happen to be trapped. Then they'll come through and they'll put scour protection around the cofferdam. Imagine when you're on the beach and you're out walking and the tide's going back and forth. As the tide goes around your ankles, the sand swirls and creates a little hole. That's scour. So you want to prevent that. Now, the bridge really doesn't care too much about the scour. The foundations are 170 feet deep. But you want to make sure that you maintain the existing river quality. And so you put the rock on top of the sand to hold it in place. And then you come through and you fill to create that sand island. So that gets filled up. And at that point, they put a work platform across the top of it, bring out a drill rig, and begin to do the drilling. So now I've created a place to work. That is essentially the end of the in-water work window. I'm no longer in the water. I have a separate place to work. That's that October 31st deadline. After that, we can work year-round. You'll notice here that there's two different amounts of material that go in here. That's because one side of the river is deeper and one side is shallower because there's a bend in the river. And a bend in a river one side usually is shallow, one side usually deeper. So here's kind of a plan view with lots of arrows and circles and whatnot. But essentially, here's the six drilled shafts, 10 foot diameter, 150 feet to 170 feet deep. Then there's the pile cap. That's the gray thing here on the model. That's 55 feet by 95 feet. Ranges from 10 feet deep to 18 feet deep. Pretty good size chunk of concrete. From there, the tower gets built on top of that. And that pile cap kind of holds all those drilled shafts together to act as a unit. So it's tying them all together. Then you'll see the drill rig will be mobilized. Here's our cofferdam. We put a temporary work platform. There's the temporary work bridge. And we come out here to do the drilling. Now, this is not driving. This is drilling. This is like a great big 10-foot diameter and it's got teeth on the bottom of it. And they, it spins, and they push it down. So it's drilled. And then they take the material out from the center of it as they go down. So you can see here's an image of one in place. This is Malcolm. Malcolm is the driller on our project site. So they drill one down. They put on another piece, drill that down, put another piece, drill that down, and keep going. And that takes about two months per tower. So you can see here they're going to drive this one down, and then they'll put a second one. So now that I've done that, I've got all of my drilled shafts done. I've got my great big concrete pier done. Now what happens? Now I start building 
the tower. Okay. I put in a tower crane. And there's this section in the middle that doesn't have cables. So you'll see some scaffolding to build that. It's got a technical term called a pier table. Don't worry about that. It's about 100 and 113 feet 9 inches. <laughs> and then that gets built off of scaffolding. And then they do what they call a cantilevered construction. They build a section on either side, about 16 feet, string some cables, do another one, put some temporary cables, do another one, do another one, and they kind of go out together. So you'll see a series of permanent cables and temporary cables because each segment's about 16 feet and the permanent cables are at 32, 6. They've got to put some temporaries in between. But what you're doing is you're kind of cantilevering out with each one. And each cantilever is 16 foot 3. And how they cantilever out is with these form travelers. So you can see here we've got temporary cables here and permanent cables and these form travelers. See, they're kind of hanging out in space. So they'll build this side and that side and then string a cable up, thread the needle, come back down to the other side. One side helps balance the other side full load. That's why it's a very efficient structure and very thin because one side's balancing the other and it travels the load straight down here. So it's a very efficient structure, which means it's very cost effective. But you can see here's the coffer dam. Then you've got your uh, tower crane. They'll be building this, and this will start to work its way out. Essentially, you'll see 20 sections. So there'll be 20 times this will move on this side, and 20 times that will move on that side. And you'll all be able to watch it live with two uh, webcams, one from the OMSI side, one from the OHSU side. And there's a daily time lapse, a weekly time lapse, and a monthly time lapse. So. If you go on vacation, you can always come back and see what happened. <laughs> so that's in a nutshell of what you can expect to see. Um, they'll build Tower 3, which is the tower on the west, first. Then they'll move the crews over to the other side. And then there'll be Tower 4, which is the one on the east. They'll build that second. And then they'll do the closure pour, and we'll all have a big celebration um, for that. After that, we have to put on all the systems work the things that make the trains go. Then we have to do training for all our bus and rail operators on the new system, safety certify it, and then open to the public in uh, September of 2015. Any questions? When is it that the towers have to be done by or are supposed to be done by? The There's a schedule that you have in your, your packet. Actually, we'll go to the, go to the next slide here so you can see Here's the piers and the towers. So you can see this one here is the, the red is tower three, and this is tower four. And there's the terminology, the next page in your thing, because tower three, as he just said, is the west tower. So you'll see on some of the materials, you'll have, you also have a, uh, what's the vertical? A linear schedule, as they call it. You'll just see different. This is how the whole project gets done. It's in your packet, and you'll see the words like Tower 3, just so you know which one it is, because okay. they use those terms interchangeably. And then on, it, it has more of the detail of, you know, here's you know, the temporary cables and the permanent cables. We'll do this side first, and then we'll do the other side, and then we'll close them together. So there's lots of detail for uh, more engineer uh, types. <laughs> Can you speak as to how uh, the streetcar would tie in if the close the loop project goes forward in terms of the approaches? And sure. Essentially, on the west side, over by uh, Schnitzer's Future Campus, there is streetcar running along Moody. Moody goes north and south. The bridge goes east and west. And so there would be a connection made there at Moody and Porter where the streetcar would turn go on the approach and go up over the bridge. On the other side, the streetcar, which is currently under construction, comes down to Water Avenue. This would make the connection, make the turn on Sherman, which was where the new station is over by OMSI, and come up on the bridge. So we've been working very closely to coordinate all the details to accommodate that in the future. That's a separate project, and the region is seeking separate funding on that. 
as part of the Portland streetcar. So you guys can now build it, right? <laughs> um, well, just one, I mean, this is dumb, but <clears throat> a lot of times in the news we've got all sorts of projects that are taking forever. You know, you got the I-5 bridge, you got, and actually this has kind of been going on forever. How, uh, how are you feeling about actually being able to present a plan? Um, it's, I know, it's kind of a goofy question, but you know, process sometimes takes so long, and here we are at least at a decision. So just your feelings on that, and was it difficult? Or? The project is on schedule. Was it difficult? Yes. But we have uh, a team of very talented, and dedicated people, uh, both from TriMet and all our consultant teams that are working very hard to secure all the necessary permits to schedule the project. We have a great contractor, Kiwit, who's teamed up with TYLN, which is a, uh, one of the nation's uh, best bridge engineers to help build this. Kiwit has been there, done that. They've built a lot of cable stay bridges. This is known technology. This is not something that's cutting edge. This is a bridge technology that's been built many times. So this is a team that's been here, done that, a designer who's been here, done that, recognized in the nation as one of the top builders and top designers, and we're going to go do it again. This is on the critical path. This is the longest duration. They're starting on time. We have every expectation they'll finish on time. And this bridge is uh, totally different from any other bridge that we have in the city? Yes. yes. Uh, in this team of designers, have they worked in Portland before? Have they worked on the Kiwi is, is in, uh, based out of Vancouver. This particular uh, section of Kiwi is in Vancouver, Washington. Mm -hmm. So they've done a variety of bridges. This is the kind of the, uh, I think there's only one or two other cable stayed in this general area. Uh, for example, I think the Charles Ridger River Bridge in Boston that you might see in some of the ads for Boston is one that Kiwi did. Um, can you address some of the criticism regarding the selection of the bridge height uh, as opposed to not being a few feet higher uh, for the demands of some river users, what that might mean in terms of cost or in bridge design, uh, grades, heights, approaches, and so forth? Okay. So remember we picked a bridge type that provided the thinnest structure and the widest clearance for river users. Remember, we want stations at grade at OHSU's new campus, the Snitzer campus, for the new medical and dental school, you want a station at grade. At OMSI, you want a station at grade. They currently have 900,000 visitors a year, and OPERA's looking to uh, redo their area and make a small venue. And you want to accommodate bicyclists and pedestrians. To meet the American with Disabilities Act, you can only have a grade up to 5%. So I have a station at grade, 5% slope up and down. It's pretty much as high as you can get without taking the stations and moving them so they're grade separated, which doesn't support land use. So this is a way to try to accommodate both. Now remember, over on the uh, west side of the river, all those streets are being raised about 14 feet in the air. So we've raised that whole district 14 feet, made as thin structure as possible, and took the grade as far as possible to meet code to maximize the clearance. So we've turned every knob we can turn, and it still allows clearance 99% of the time, most of the time during the river. We've taken a look at every river user through a survey over a series of years. It said, when do you use the river? How big are your vessels? And did an analysis of what's the impact. So we've, it's been a very thoughtful process. The results report from all that work is over 500 pages long of all of the analysis done to pick that bridge height. So the teams worked really hard in order to accommodate a balance between river users and the uh, land use. All right. Thank you very much.